So I am, without further ado, going to move on to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for today. I'm so delighted and touched that Chris Poynton is joining us to share his and Kate Granger's story. Hello, my name is. What a phenomenon. Um, and what a fabulous example of using networks to actually make a change in the culture of how we work. So, Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. So good morning everyone. Hello, my name is Chris Poynton. I can't start any talk of mine without now using those four iconic words. All started through social media. I'd like to thank Caroline for inviting me along today to talk to you guys and to talk through at a conference which is very relatable to the campaign and where it was born. I was thinking last night, sat in the hotel, when was the last time I was actually in Liverpool? And I was at the Hospice UK conference last year, and um, towards the end of last year, giving a keynote speech there. The time before that was when Kate and I came to go on a ferry across the Mersey, which is something that Kate wanted to do, um, because it had sort of special family memories because of her mother. So that was the second to last time that I was in Liverpool trying to do. And today, I want to take you on a bit of a journey. It's going to be an emotional journey, it's going to be an inspiring journey and it's also going to be a journey around the amazing legacy of Dr. Kate Granger and I want you all to think about your own legacies and I'm going to split that into three parts so the first part is probably the most important part what do you want to be remembered for when you die what do you want your legacy to be because I'm a firm believer that in this world everyone can make a difference especially in the world that we're currently living with social media. The second part is around the dates that are important to you in your life. What is the most memorable date in your life? Everyone will have one. It could be the day that you um, got married. It could be the day that you started working at the organisation you work for, etc. And the third part is around your own life plans. And I'm sure everyone's got their own life plans, be it what's happening in the next month, what's happening in the next year, the next 10 years and so on. Kate and I certainly have life plans and I'll talk you through those today. And it's probably worth it at this point to say that my background is not in healthcare. I'm 25 years in logistics and retail, um, working for one of the uh, major supermarkets in the UK. And my journey with healthcare started when I met Kate. Also, she was um, studying medicine. I met Kate at the end of 2001. Um, she was two and a half years into a six year degree studying medicine in Edinburgh. So for the next three and a half years, I commuted every weekend pretty much between Yorkshire and Edinburgh so that Kate and I could spend time together. And it was pretty clear from the start that we were meant to be together. We were gonna spend the rest of our lives together. And a year on from meeting, we got engaged and then we start to make our own life plans. And our life plans revolved around, uh, revolved around three aspects. The most important part was our careers at the start. And Kate was a passionate and dedicated individual in medicine who wanted to be the best doctor she could be. I was working myself up the management ladder um, in the organisation I worked for, so very much career was at the forefront of our minds in our life plans. We also then had plans for family in later life. You know, Kate and I were relatively young when we were when we met and we were making these plans. And then we also knew that we wanted to travel. We knew that we wanted to see the world, um, either prior to having a family or you know after having a family. But we knew that those plans um, were have been made together for the rest of our lives. We then started to plan our wedding. So as soon as Kate finished at university in 2005, July 23rd is the happiest day of my life so far. It is the day that Kate and I married. It is the day that she walked down the aisle to the music that we wanted to listen to, you know, on a beautiful day in Yorkshire, um, with the people around us that we wanted to be there. And subsequently, you know, later on in our lives, something that we probably never thought we would do, is we actually renewed our wedding vows. It was one of the things that Kate wanted to do um, once she fell ill. 
Um, so not only did I get to marry the girl my dreams once, I actually married her twice without having to go through any messy divorce. So it was actually really nice being able to do that. But obviously a very emotional as well, given the circumstances. We then, we then had, so that was in 2005, we then had several years of fairly good living. You know, we had very little financial worries. Um, Kate was leading herself up the um, career path as a doctor, the junior doctor, coming to a registrar. I was working myself on the management ladder um, where I was working. And life was good. We had a beautiful home. We went on nice holidays. And we thought, let's go away on an extended holiday to California. Um, it was a place where we had family and friends. It was a place where my grandma wanted to go and see her new great grandkids. So we took my grandma with us, left her with my auntie and uncle, and we decided to do a bit of touring around California. And everything was going fine, apart from the fact that Kate just wasn't really feeling well. She had back pains, she was tired, and she just wasn't feeling herself. And we put that down to a few things. We put it down to tiredness from working long hours as a junior doctor. We put it down to jet lag from obviously the travel across to America. And then we just put it down to being in different hotels, different cars, as we traveled across the state. But there came a point, and this is the last photograph that we've actually got taken of Kate prior to me the following day, finding her riding around in agony on the bed in the accommodation where we were staying with severe kidney pain. She had been taking painkillers, paracetamol, ibuprofen, etc. in advance of that, so these drugs were not working. And it was at that point, as the non-medic in the relationship, that I decided we have to get Kate into ER in America. <coughs> and if we hadn't have done that at that point, 24 hours after, Kate would have probably died there and then in America with acute renal failure. So we went into hospital in the US, we got patched up, Kate had some stents inserted, we were made fit to fly home, and then we flew back to the UK to pursue further treatment within the amazing NHS, which is an organisation that I'm passionate about because not only did it give Kate her career, but it also gave her um, an extended period of time at the end of her life, which we didn't expect to have for the reasons that I'll come on to. The next six months, Kate was in hospital for four and a half months out of that six months, which was um, towards the end of um, 2011. And throughout that time, every result, every scan, every scenario that was played out, the results always came back as the worst case scenario. And it soon became apparent that we were dealing with a terminal cancer. And it soon became apparent that that terminal cancer Kate was given six to 12 months to live. So our life plans at that stage were thrown in the bin. Our plans that we had for a family, forget about. Our plans that we had for traveling in five, 10 years time, but it wasn't gonna happen. We had to concentrate our lives into a much short space of time. But on the flip side, Kate was terminally ill and she was in hospital for four and a half months out of that six months. And she, through the power of social media, she, was, she kept connected to the outside world and she kept being, she kept inspiring other people because of how she approached her illness. She was writing a diary which turned out into a book um, which is still available to buy today. She went on to write a second book as well and um, all the profits go to the charity. And she was inspiring hundreds of thousands of people across the world because of how she approached um, her journey. We then got to New Year's Eve again at the end of 2011 and we were watching the fireworks over the city skyline in Leeds and Kate was in hospital and we made a decision at that point that enough was enough. The chemotherapy that she'd been having for that period of time wasn't giving her the quality of life versus quantity of life that she had left and so we made a decision to stop chemotherapy at that point so we could enjoy as much of our lives that we have left together. And part way through that four and a half months of being in hospital, Kate was told by one of her consultants that I don't think the council is going to let you work again, Kate. I don't think you're going to be able to be back on the wall doing the job that you love in the NHS. And Kate said to that consultant, I will work again. In some capacity, I will work again because it's something that I want to do. It's part of 
the rest of my life I want to achieve. Three weeks after making that decision to stop chemotherapy, Kate was back on the walls, doing the job that she loved to do, looking after all the people three days a week, and that picture on the right hand side is Kate, um, back on the walls. But then followed a, a lengthy period of time where Kate was actually quite well. You know, the outside world looking in, you wouldn't have thought there's anything wrong with Kate. You know, she was still working, um, her hair had grown back, she was doing so many activities, we were ticking off things on the bucket list. Like I said, we renewed our wedding vows as one of those things. And it made Kate think about her own core values as a doctor. And this was even before the campaign started. Because she was being asked to speak at events and because she was being um, followed across social media, she was very much thinking about her values. So, um, so yeah, so Kate's values, like I said, and this video is available on our website, so if people do want to go and um, watch the, um, the values first and from Kate, then by all means go on to the website. But she talked around the values in four separate ways. And the first one that Kate talks around is around communication, which is something that everyone talks about in business, in the NHS, across healthcare, around how important communication is between healthcare workers, between patients, and between um, individuals at all levels in any organisation. And there's various forms of communication that become, can be construed as being good, and there's also various forms of communication that you know, could be improved on. So the examples that Kate talks around are, when Kate was first diagnosed with her terminal cancer, which is a desmoplastic small round cell tumour, which is a very rare form of sarcoma. She was in a side room in a hospital. The consultant came in and pretty much without looking at Kate said, your cancer has spread. And then they couldn't leave the room quick enough to answer any queries that Kate had and to talk to her around the ramifications of that and the next steps. So that's probably an example of not how to communicate bad news. But then, on the flip side to that, there was another episode where um, a different consultant came into the room to talk to Kate about her, um, about the next steps on treatment. And this consultant sat down next to the bed, next to Kate. Um, he actually sat on the hospital bed, which is against, uh, against the rules in the NHS, obviously. Um, so that he was at the same eye level as Kate, because something that's very important is about being at eye level. He introduced himself and he talked to Kate about the spread of the cancer and the treatment that was needed. He then took a few moments of silence for Kate to you know, get, gather her thoughts, and then he was there to answer any questions that Kate had at that point, and to obviously be there for the emotional breakdown that occurred. That was an example of how communication probably should be done. Um, and it also relates to the second value, which is all around how the little things really matter. So somebody introducing themselves might seem like a very, very small thing, and it is, in essence, but it's something that doesn't happen every time. It's something that doesn't happen in healthcare across the world. It's things like making somebody a cup of tea. It's like sitting down sitting down next to the bed on a chair so that they're at the same eye level rather than looming over somebody. It's those little things that do really make a difference and everyone can do them in their own right. And it might seem insignificant, but something as simple as just asking how somebody is when they're in a hospital bed might be the only conversation that that person has that day or in that sort of few hours. So those, re those things really do matter. The one thing that Kate was passionate about in life, as well as in healthcare, was around knowing exactly what was going on for her. So this was even before she was ill. You know, Kate was a um, quite a um, passionate person about what was going on with her. So she wanted to know everything, and she was referred to while she was in hospital. You know, within earshot by people on the wards as that girl with DSRCT. So within a few sentences, she was a rare cancer. She wasn't an, indiv an individual, she was just a rare cancer. And is that right in this day and age that people should be able to 
talk about a patient who's literally, you know, a few metres away and talk about them as though they are just a rare form of cancer and not an actual individual. And person-centred care is something that should be and needs to be even more at the forefront of what we do within, within healthcare. And then the final piece around Kate's values was around seeing her as an individual and not seeing her as that patient or rare cancer. You know, Kate was my wife, Kate was an auntie, she was a sister, you know, she was um, an auntie to, like I said, at the time when she did the speech, she was an auntie to a newborn that was coming along. Um, she loved to bake, you can probably gather she loved to bake. Um, she loved to play the flute, she played in an orchestra, she loved to raise money for charity. She loved to do a whole host of things, far more than just having a rare cancer. And that was what Kate wanted to be remembered for, and that's what Kate will be remembered for, for all those other things that she did, aside from being terminally ill. And I think it's something that we sometimes forget within healthcare and within you know, the wider world around making sure that we're seeing people for who they are and not for what illness that they may have or for what disability they may have because everyone in the world is equally important and everyone can make a difference to other people. But like I said, that video is available on the website as well so if you want to um, go on there, it's an extended video, it's sort of 25 minutes, that was just a short clip today, um, but there is the extended video on there. So then like I said, we had a period of relatively good living and in that period, we managed to do a whole host of things. One of which was to raise a huge amount of money for charity. And Kate was passionate about doing things for other people. One of which was to raise that money for the other, uh, for the other charities. But then the cancer woke up and Kate had to go back in for further treatment in the NHS. And we thought it was the right decision to make at the time because she'd had such a good output from the first round of chemotherapy, having sort of 15 to 18 months of relatively good living, we'd be daft not to try again with more chemotherapy. So we had more chemotherapy um, and it was on the back of one of those admissions where Kate was in hospital, she was being seen by a nurse who didn't introduce themselves, took blood from her whilst talking to another nurse who was looking after another patient on the same ward. She was then seen by a consultant who came in to see her with their entourage, looming over the bed, um, didn't introduce themselves. And because Kate was so high profile across social media, and because it was such a rare form of cancer, a lot of the junior doctors and a lot of the consultants wanted them to go and see Kate because of the rareness of it, but also because of who she was. So people, it was almost like she was a healthcare celebrity. Um, and she never saw that, you know, and she never, she never used to like the word inspirational or inspiring, but she certainly was, and, you know, I, I, can, I can quite easily say that, but she certainly was. But she never saw that. She just wanted to make a difference for other people, irrespective of what's going on in her own life. We then had other people come in to see us that day um, across healthcare, not introduce themselves. And then we met Brian. Now, Brian had a name. Brian was a porter. He came to take Kate down to, the, um, to have a scan, taking extra care through the hospital corridors in Leeds, talking about cricket, because he must have picked up at some point that Kate liked her cricket. Um, so talking about things that were just normal, so not healthcare related at all. And it's those little things like I mentioned earlier on that really do make a difference. And then that evening, Kate and I were talking about this when we were back on the ward and reflecting on the day's events and Kate was whinging. She was whinging about the lack of introductions and the lack of introductions on that particular day really made us both think about things. And for those people that work for me, they will know that one of my big um, gripes is when people come to me with an issue but aren't prepared to go and do something about it. And I think it's true in the world, there's far too many people in this world who are quite easy to whinge and moan about things that are going on but aren't prepared to go away and actually do something themselves about it. They expect other people to do something different in order to make that thing better. Why can't you make a difference? Why can't you be the change that you want to see in the world? 
And so that evening I just said to Kate simply, look darling, you need to stop whinging or we need to do something about it because we can't carry on. At that point, Kate had around 25,000 followers across, across Twitter. So I said, why don't we use your already big social media presence to start some kind of campaign? And we said, let's call it something like hashtag hello my name is. And it was born. It was born from a conversation between a terminally ill lady and her non-medic husband in a hospital in Leeds. It was born. And that's where it started. That is where the Hello My Name Is journey started. That was on the 30th of August 2013. And look where it's gone from there. And to be honest, at the start, should it have been needed? Probably not. You know, it's four words, it takes very little time. But the amount of response that we got back after Kate had posted this tweet was unbelievable. The amount of examples we were getting from people across the world saying that the introductions weren't happening in their hospital or in their healthcare setting. I didn't design the logo either, by the way. I know it says on there that she sent me home to design the logo. Um, it was one of our designer friends that designed it, and what we said to him is, the only thing it's got to incorporate is a smile, because it's hard to actually say the four words and mean it without smiling at your patient or your um, colleague or whoever you are talking to. So we had to incorporate the smile, which it clearly does. And it became a social media phenomenon quite early on. You know, the first week, the first two weeks, the amount of retweets, the amount of trends that were going on with it, the amount of followers that Kate was gaining because of the campaign. Such a simple idea that started on social media and then just, you know, organically grew across other platforms as well. Kate's brother um, designed a website for us, and which is still in operation today. <coughs> And that holds a whole host of information around the campaign. There's the videos on there. Um, there is photo galleries. There's educational resources. There is the links to be able to buy the name badges and lanyards. Um, and various other things regarding the campaign and regarding the tour. We then um, started to be asked to write blogs in different journals. This is just an example from the BMJ a couple of years ago that you know, Kate was asked to write. And it clearly shows the doctor there at the same eye level as the patient introducing themselves. And this is just one from you know, a whole catalogue of examples that Kate was being asked to write in. And I think there's a point as well where Kate was still terminally ill and I think a lot of people from time to time, you know, family included, probably forgot that Kate was terminally ill and she was going to die in the not too distant future. And that was something that we kept on having to talk to people about because the other thing as well in society is that we don't talk a lot about death and dying and we need to because it's going to happen to everyone. There's an interesting stat at a conference that I went to last week on the screen and it said 100% of all British people will die. That's a stat. And, you know, and, and it's funny but it's true but we don't talk about it and it's something that we should and especially now in social media world we can talk about that more openly and there's a lot more um, resources behind it. We then started to get a lot of photographs through across the world with people doing selfie campaigns, people having charity bake sales, um, it went across into the police force in the UK, people were having name badges made by different companies and like I said all of this was to raise awareness of the campaign, to raise awareness of Kate but also to make a difference to other people, to make a difference to patients. And what we're not saying with the campaign is that people weren't doing this before because a lot of people who work in the NHS will have been introducing themselves before. So what I don't want, I don't want to come across as patronising to those people that did. But there was also a lot of people that didn't. And it's that reminder, refresher that was needed at the time, which has obviously grown across the world. We then move on to 2014 and Kate was asked to present her poster at the Quality Forum in Paris. Um, she was walking around the conference floor being asked for photographs, being asked to speak to people and she managed to indoctrinate her own healthcare here at Don Berwick at that conference. And it was at that conference, on the journey home from that conference, where Kate started to talk about her legacy. So as I said at the start, legacy is important. And she said to me on the train on the way home, she said, Chris, if I was to die today, I know that I've made a difference in healthcare. I know that my legacy will live on for future generations because I've done something different 
to help other people and she could rest easy knowing that she'd done that but that was in 2014 um, you know Kate should have been long dead by then if you listened to the doctors in the early stages but she wasn't she was still traveling the country um, talking at events still working still doing charity bake sales still jumping out of planes still swimming the English Channel still doing various things to raise money for charity and to help other people whilst being terminally ill so the campaign was born in the Leeds Teaching Hospital and I don't think they want to be remembered for the hospital where the campaign started it could have been any hospital in the world it just so happened it was in Leeds they are now the flagship trust for the campaign the chief exec there every time he welcomes new starters to the trust he talks about the campaign he talks about Kate and the story behind it and he actively endorses the campaign across the actual trust itself he wears his name badge with pride and he's always talking the campaign but there is a key difference between an endorsement from senior management and an enforcement from senior management so the campaign does not want to become some kind of tick box exercise that people have to do it's something that people should be wanting to do especially if they work in healthcare should be wanting to do for their patients and for their colleagues and relatives so it should be something that's endorsed but not enforced is the key uh, message from there and Kate also worked in Leeds for a time while she was terminally ill so some days she was going in and having treatment and then two weeks later she'd be back on the wards in the same hospital actually working as a doctor so she had to live with that balance um, whilst um, going through her treatment and her professional career and she did actually become a consultant before she died which is one of her key ambitions in her career to become a consultant and she made that she got to be a, con a consultant the NHS approached us in 2014 wanting to remember Kate through the compassionate care awards that we now um, present every year at the NHS Expo so that started in 2014 they approached us six months prior to the actual event taking place and Kate being Kate said well I might not be here, I might be dead by the time the event takes place. So I'll record a video. So she recorded a video to play at the event just in case she wasn't with us still. She was there to present the awards in 2014 and in 2015. 2016 was the first year where I presented them um, on behalf of obviously Kate and the Compassionate Care Awards for the NHS. And this year we've just presented them a few months ago to recognise individuals and organisations that have gone above and beyond on compassionate care. But like I say, I think people that work within the NHS um, all deserve the accolades and all deserve the awards because they do an amazing job every second of every day. And I was truly humbled this year because I was asked to present certificates to those people that were first on scene at the atrocities that happened in Manchester. So that was a humbling experience for myself and obviously something I would rather not have been doing because it would have meant that that wouldn't have occurred. But you know, a humbling experience all the same. So if you've got something as well that costs very little money, takes very little time and improves patient care, the politicians want to get involved. So we were invited to go and speak to the then Prime Minister David Cameron uh, at Downing Street and we had a, a productive sort of 15, 20 minute meeting with him around the campaign a few years ago. We then got asked to go and speak with Nicola Sturge up in Scotland. She pledged some money to the uh, campaign up in Scotland as well. And a few months ago, I was invited back again to talk about the next steps of the campaign up in Scotland. Kate also had a suite named after her down in Watford in the hospital. And you've got Jeremy Hunt there um, having his picture taken outside the Granger suite in Watford Hospital. And then it was also mentioned as part of the um, response front, uh, in the Francis Inquiry. So going back to social media, one of the best ways to get any message across social media is to get endorsements for the campaign or for the um, uh, and campaign that's running from high profile, highly followed individuals, business leaders, celebrities. And so here's just a collection of some of those celebrities and business leaders that have in endorsed the campaign. Through the contacts that Kate and I amassed over the last few years and through the business that I work in, we've managed to get those contacts. And it's little things like Kate wanted to go and see Kyla Minogue in concert as part of her bucket list. So, you know, we booked tickets, as anybody would, book tickets to go and see her. But then I thought, I want Kate to experience the best in life that she can have because she, de she deserves the best in life. 
So I made it my mission to make sure that anything that we did, irrespective of where it was in the world, I would go above and beyond to try and surprise Kate with little things. So things like going backstage to meet Kylie Minogue, to get her to endorse the campaign, especially given that she's been through cancer in her life, was one of my missions as we went to the concert. And it was a complete surprise to Kate, and you know, it was an amazing day. But then other things um, that are on there. And Sir Richard Branson's one of our key endorsers for the campaign, and I will uh, relate back to that as we go later into the presentation. We then move into 2015, and um, we wanted to almost relaunched the campaign across the NHS. So we enlisted the help of an organisation called Listening to Action, who contacted every NHS trust, asked them if they would like to be involved, and on that day we managed to touch around 400,000 NHS staff through their, tr their own individual trusts, endorsing the campaign and launching the campaign within the trust. It was also quite a strange day in our household because the cancer had woken up again, so Kate was having chemotherapy, so we started the day by going to the radio studio in, in Leeds. Um, Kate gave two radio interviews. We then went into the hospital where Kate was having further chemotherapy for the, for the cancer. She then had to use the nurse's office to do another interview on Radio 2. Um, we then went back to having chemotherapy and then she went on to the TV studio to do some local TV work. All day long, the hashtag across Twitter was trending and Kate's phone was red hot with the amount of tweets, the amount of messages, the amount of um, inspiring comments that we were getting for the campaign across the NHS and it's something that we look back on now and think that was one of the turning points again in the campaign. And then Kate was being asked again to go and talk at different events and some weeks for Kate it would be chemotherapy today, talk in London tomorrow, the following day she'd be back at work for a day and then next week she would have the, the usual um, infections and everything that she used to get after having ca uh, the chemotherapy. So we decided to take it on a tour in the UK in June 2015. Because she was being asked to speak at so many events, we thought let's take a week out of our schedules, let's put the word out there that we're going to do this and see what response we got. And within an hour Kate had 60 invites to go and talk at different events. So we had to consolidate some of that into um, 16 events that we could go and talk at in a week. And so Kate delivered 16 inspiring talks, the 16th being equally as good as the first, and this was very much around um, where the campaigns come from, but also what's next for the campaign and obviously what's next for Kate and I. It now operates in over 20 countries, so we know that across the world, the Hello My Name Is campaign is op operational. But my plan and my legacy is that it's operating in every country across the world, and that's what I want my legacy to be, um, obviously on behalf of Kate and I, for the campaign. Just a few, <coughs> excuse me, just a few weeks ago, I returned from a three-week trip of Australia and New Zealand, where we delivered 21 talks in 25 days across various cities, and the uptake and the engagement and the passion shown by the people at work in healthcare across Australia and New Zealand was unbelievable. And it was strange to see how far the campaign has come through social media. The power of social media is unbelievable um, and it's completely relatable to, to the campaign. So in the last four years, it's had over 1.8 billion Twitter impressions. I'm not going to tell you what a Twitter impression is, I'm sure you all know. Um, some events I go to have to talk them through Twitter. It's the start of that relationship. We do have global ambassadors across the world that actively support the campaign and are the role models for the campaign. And it says on there, yeah, a million people every 36 hours are treated in the NHS. If the campaign <coughs> makes a difference for one person anywhere in the world, then all the hard work that Kate put in before she died and all the hard work that I'm continuing to put in has been worth it because it's made a difference to that one person. And I think one of the key messages is that some people, if they're lucky, might only come into contact with healthcare workers or hospitals once in their life, but for them that's their only experience of healthcare. People that work within healthcare obviously experience that every single day but we need to make sure that that experience is equally as good for everyone that comes into contact with them. And one of the things that the Chief Exec at Leeds always says is, if you treat people as though they are a member of your own family or a close friend, 
then you can't go too far wrong in terms of treating them how you'd want to be treated. And I know that you know healthcare is under a lot of stress and financial pressures, but given the resources available and given the time available, we should be treating them as though they are a member of our own family. So then as we move forward into um, the end of June, July, sort of last year, to run shorter, so it started off at 15 months, it was then sort of nine months, and then six months, and four months, and so on. And we had to make a decision then that, do we want to pursue further chemotherapy, or do we want to say, enough's enough, you know, this is the time that we've been um, not wanting to happen, but we knew it was going to happen at some point, um, and so we made that decision, and Kate was um, originally, Kate w wished that she could die at home, but as time went on, we knew that that probably wasn't going to be possible, um, as much for me and for the family as for anybody else. So we made the decision that she would go into St Gemma's Hospice, which is an amazing organisation in Leeds, which many hospices are, um, great organisations. And it was somewhere that Kate had delivered two talks over the last few years as well, so it was quite a poignant place for her to pass. And, but irrespective of that, before she died, she set some fairly challenging um, targets again, as she did in her, in her whole life. So one of the targets was to get the new Prime Minister of the country to endorse the campaign. So following the Brexit result, obviously we had a change of Prime Minister. Um, Theresa May had been in her job three weeks and Kate was like, I want Theresa May to endorse the campaign. And the second thing that she wanted to do was to reach a quarter of a million pounds for charity before she died. At the time that she set that um, challenge, we were at about £210,000. Through the power of social media, we got to £250,000 in about five days, I think. So that's another part of social media that's amazing. I mean, Kate had like 45,000 followers when she died. And to achieve a quarter of a million pounds was unbelievable. And the picture there on the right-hand side is Kate and I celebrating with a glass of fizz in the hospice, um, uh, reaching that milestone, reaching that target. The second challenge around Theresa May was a bit more difficult to, um, to get. But through the contacts that we'd amassed, we managed to get Theresa May to endorse the campaign through writing a letter to Kate, a handwritten letter, um, saying, Dear Kate, my name's Theresa. And then she went on to talk about how proud she was of the work that Kate had done in her life and how proud Kate should be of the work that she'd done in her life as well and how her legacy will continue, not just across the NHS, but just across healthcare in general. So that was quite a poignant time as well. But then we refer back to memorable dates as well. So like I said, 23rd of July 2005, it was the happiest day of my life when Kate and I got married. 23rd of July last year was our 11th wedding anniversary. Um, but it was also the saddest day of my life because it was the day when Kate died. So on our 11th wedding anniversary, in a hospice in Leeds, surrounded by family and friends, um, Kate passed. And she actually passed to the music that she wanted to pass to. She was in control to the end, you know, she knew what, what was happening, she knew that she wanted to die at that point, and she did. And yes, a very sad day, but on the flip side, because we were, she was no longer in pain, because she was no longer in any kind of distress, which she'd been through so much in the previous five years, it was almost a relief for the friends and family as well, because she wasn't in that pain. And I look back and think to myself, and people say how sad and how unfortunate it is, which it is. But Kate and, ha Kate and I had the chance to talk about things before she died. The atrocities that go on in this world at the minute, people don't get that chance, and they're the people that aren't, aren't lucky. You know, Kate and I were lucky to have had each other for as long as we did, to be able to talk about things as openly as what we could, and to be sure that we planned everything that we wanted to plan. And I think it is... Um, a sad day, but like I said, it was a relief as well. And then through social media, Kate lived her final few days through social media, which many of you might have followed on Twitter, and she wanted to do that. She wanted to make sure that people knew what was going on. So as soon as close family and friends knew that she'd died, I put the tweet out at the bottom saying that she'd passed. And then within sort of 10 minutes, the responses coming through were unbelievable. You know, it was BBC breaking news across the news channels. It was we were getting reports from Canada, from Australia, from various other parts of the world about 
um, how sorry they were that she'd passed, but also sending messages of condolence for the family. Sir Richard Branson publicly tweeted about Kate, and he also sent a really nice private email to myself. And then various other people from across media, healthcare, and celebrities all messaged to pass on their thoughts and condolence. And it just shows, one, once again, social media, but also how inspiring and impactful uh, Kate actually was in the world to many people. So what's next? So I'm currently on a 12 month sabbatical from the job that I've been doing for the last 17 years. I'm on a global tour, so this is part of that global tour. We um, am trying to achieve as many countries as we can and as many organisations within the UK as we can across the next, um, well, the next 10 months now. We've recently had a play commissioned that's going to be all about Kate's life. I'm in the middle of writing a book which is called The Other Side of the Other Side, which is trying to explain to people that are going through something similar to what I've been through, trying to help them how they can cope and how they can go through it. We've also recently had a song released all about the campaign, which went to number seven in its first week of release. And a lot of that has got to where it got to because of social media. And the reason why all those, all those things are coming into play is because I've now set a new challenge for the campaign, which is to reach half a million pounds for the two charities that we support by the end of next year, which I think is an achievable target. Um, we're currently at 325,000 pounds. So, you know, we've got sort of 14 months to achieve the rest. So I think um, it's achievable. So as I just come to wrap up, there is a, a short video on here, but I don't think it'll, I don't think it'll work. So I'll, I'll talk you through it. But once again, this is available on the website. And it's all around the legacy. And it's all around making a difference for other people. So I've talked through life plans. Obviously, life plans, everyone can have a life plan, but they can change quite easily. I'm sure everyone's been thinking about what their memorable dates have been in their lives. And like I said, mine is the 23rd of July. And then the third and final thing was around legacy. And what do you want to be remembered for when you die? You know, somebody mentioned to myself a few weeks ago around Kate's legacy. You know, people say that it's left for people. People leave a legacy for others. Actually, they said, Yes, she's left it for people, but it's actually been left within people because people really do feel that it makes a difference. And it's such a simple message that makes a difference. And the video that is on there, it's like, say, about 20 second video. It's Kate just saying about her own legacy and around how communication has improved within the NHS and how she wants her name to be remembered, but also her legacy to be remembered for a better NHS that thinks, that thinks of patients as people and not just diseases and it's around how we communicate that message and how we introduce ourselves because an introduction is just the start of that therapeutic relationship it's not the be all and end all but it does make for such a better experience um, as we go through those conversations and then finally they're just the websites where you can buy Kate's books like I say or you can download the song or you can just see a whole host of other information around the campaign and what's next and what events are coming up and like I said it's going to be all to raise that half million pounds for charity but I think the final thing is just on like I said the legacy piece just to think about how can you make a difference because everyone in this room can make a difference in their own way in some small way thank you all for listening <laughs>